Okay, we are recording. This is the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum Oral History Project. I'm interviewing Ed McNamara. My name is Hannah Nordhaus. It is the 23rd of January, 2004, and we are at Ed's house in Arvada. I'm going to turn off this light real quick. Sure. A little bit of glare. Okay. Um, so to start, um, I'd just like to get a little bit of your personal background. Can you tell me where and when you were born, um, where you grew up, what your parents did, and, uh, your, your education, that sort of thing, okay. and how you ended up, so what profession you chose. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was born in Salida, Colorado. I'm a native. August the 18th, 1924, grew up there, uh, spent uh, my young life uh, attending school, St. Joe's grade school and Salida High School. After uh, the, uh, after school, why Uncle Sam got a hold of me in 1943. Uh, funny thing about it, in the night I graduated, there was a guy from the Selective Service Board there handing out letters to all of the males who were eligible to report for induction service in Denver. Uh, spent uh, three years in the Navy on a combination of submarine service and surface ship surface. And then after the discharge in uh, April of 1946, uh, spent the summer in Salida trying to get used to civilian life again, and then went to uh, Mesa Junior College in, in Grand Junction. And after finishing there at Mesa with an associate degree, then uh, attended one year at CSU in Fort Collins, was known then as Colorado A&M, and then finished up at uh, Boulder at CU in 1954. Uh, spent my summers working oh, for a relative uncle of mine in a little town called Red Cliff as a mechanic and then uh, spent uh, three summers working in the oil fields in uh, Rangeley, Colorado as a, an associate engineer. Was married uh, in uh, August of 1954 and uh, went to work for uh, Alcoa University or uh, Aluminum Company of America and moved to Wenatchee, Washington uh, with Jan and uh, my daughter, young daughter of several, a few, just a few months to Wenatchee, Washington, where we spent uh, five years working there in what was known as an aluminum reduction plant. And uh, we missed Colorado so much that we decided we would return to Colorado. And I did uh, have a buddy in high school and college and in the Navy that had worked at Rocky Flats as a chemist and he sort of gave me a push toward inquiring uh, about employment at that, at that plant. And that would have been in the fall of 1959, I guess it was when I was home on vacation from, from Wenatchee. Uh, came to find out that one of the major uh, or primary people at the plant out there was a guy I'd gone to college with in Grand Junction, Herb Bowman, who uh, was in charge of the uh, of 91 production building and later became a uh, works manager before Dow Chemical gave up the, uh, the contract. Um, spent uh, all of those years uh, from 1960, went to work in, yes it was on February the 29th, uh, leap year, 1960, and uh, retired on uh, June the 17th, uh, 1988, after 28, yeah, well, 28 some, some years there. And have uh, lived here in Arvada uh, ever since. Okay, so um, what was your special, what did, was the job you came to Rocky Flats to do? What, what's your... Uh, yes, when I, when I uh, was working at Alcoa, we worked in what was known as facilities or the plant engineering group. And uh, when I hired with Dow Chemical, why I went into that, that particular group with a uh, supervisor, department head by the name of Bert Shepard. I'm sure a lot of people will remember him. And Bob Walker was also in the engineering group. 
uh, Carl St. John, uh, Charlie Bogart, a uh, variety of those guys that I'm sure that people recognize their names, Howard Palm, and uh, Al, I can't think of his name now, but uh, Bob Walker, uh, there were two Bob Walkers. And uh, yes, uh, worked about a year and a half in facilities, uh, various plant jobs, was stationed both at Building 111 and in Building 771, and some at uh, Building 91. At that, about that time then Herb Bowman uh, was trying to formulate or put together a group of, of uh, engineers to be uh, liaisons with the design agencies at Los, from Los Alamos and at Livermore, California. Uh, we were to be contact people for the engineers that came in to work on their various projects at Rocky Flats. And so I got into the ground floor uh, on the product engineering organization along with Ed Young and Lenny Fox and uh, oh, oh, Eddie Fellman was also in the group. All of these names are probably recognizable to various people. Uh, and so I began to work with uh, the Livermore engineers first. And one of the very first projects that I got assigned was the uh, so-called pit, uh, or as the Denver Post likes to refer to it, as the trigger for the Titan missile. And uh, had such contacts as Dave Holton and, uh, and uh, oh, oh, Eric Schuld and several other guys that I can't really remember now. Also had to handle projects with the Los Alamos Laboratory. And uh, the guy that was in charge of uh, the weapons department down at, at uh, Los Alamos was a guy by the name of Harry Wall. And uh, a variety of engineers that worked for him. Uh, the reason for two design laboratories, as I understand it from years of discussion, is that at one time the original laboratory was at Los Alamos. And there were a group of people at uh, Los Alamos that uh, the, the, the weapons industry business we, was being operated by the University of California. And they, uh, they had uh, facilities at Livermore, California. And so there was a group that split her off from the Los Alamos bunch and went to Livermore. And so we ended up with two design agencies because as I understand it, there were two definite differences in concept of how a design, a pitch should be designed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's how they, we got into to two laboratories. I often thought it was kind of wasteful, but on the other hand, it, uh, it did produce a lot of innovative designs from both organizations there. So I spent, oh, I guess uh, uh, six or eight years as a product engineer working various programs. Um, in through the late 60s, I worked on uh, the 6268 uh, program, which was the pit program for the uh, uh, Minuteman, the six, W62 and the W68 was the Poseidon missile. Uh, prior to that, I had worked on uh, various projects that were associated with uh, the uh, uh, nuclear submarine system. And it was kind of ironic because I had spent uh, a little over a year on board the USS Sturgeon in World War II. And uh, here I found myself working with materials that were going to go to the new fleet, the, nu the nuclear submarines. And uh, so in 19, <coughs> excuse me, in 1970, Two, I guess it was why uh, there were some reorganizations at, out at the plant and uh, uh, I got into uh, the supervision of the uh, Livermore programs in, in the product engineering organization. Uh, and then I, later on in the 70s why then I became so uh, Rockwell Corporation took over about mid-70s and uh, 
Uh, Jack Doerr was uh, my boss at that time, and he uh, promoted me to uh, in what was known as the Special Assembly Group. Now, the Special Assembly Group was a small group of engineers, machinists, very, very good people, Cracker Jack people like, uh, um, uh, let's see, there was uh, Ed Kennison and uh, Cole Pitts and, uh, let's see, uh, well, others that I can't recall right now. But these guys were Cracker Jack machinists that had come from various industries in the country. And so our job was to build the prototype pit. The way these agencies worked is that once they came up with a design that was ready for at least development work and eventual uh, production, would, they would bring the project into the plant and it was up to the assigned project engineer, myself or several others, to help that engineer establish the development work, having to do with various phases of the, uh, or groups of research and development, having metallurgy problems, the machining problems. Um, and <clears throat> then eventually we would get the design into the shops and work with the various shop groups for the production of various component parts. Eventually all the component parts would come to the special assembly shop at that time, it was located in building 777 Annex and uh, they, uh, they would be assembled into a what we would be known as a prototype device. <clears throat> um, this was a, a critical part of the program here because we were not only building the parts, but we were establishing the future processing for the pit, uh, the plutonium bearing pit. And uh, the development people, of course, that we had from research and development and from the production assembly group got an opportunity to see what the production parts were going to look like in the future that they would be called on to build. Once the prototype pit was built, it was shipped off to the Nevada test site or to the laboratory, depending on uh, what organization you were working with. Generally, if it was a Los Alamos pit, it was first sent down to the Los Alamos laboratory where they did some checking over. But eventually uh, the pit would end up at the Nevada test site uh, north of uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. <coughs> there the uh, pit would be loaded, so to speak, into a uh, framework and then placed down hole because all of the shots by virtue of treaty and whatnot were to be underground shots. I have a, a picture here that I can show. I, they do have some classification markings on them, but I do think at this stage of the game that it's, uh, it's old hat and they would probably be good uh, pictures to go into the museum. This is a picture here of the prototype being loaded in this canister here into a hole in the ground. Could be several thousand feet deep depending on what the expected yield of the weapon to be. Did you go to the test site and watch it? Yes, yes. Uh, we were invited on several occasions to go and to witness where our work. And it was kind of a reward to the people in the plant to see how their work ended up. The, uh, after the, the device was lowered into the hole onto the test site here, diagnostic trailers and whatnot that were lined up around here. And as you can see in the first picture, there are cables coming down from the, from the device here that will be followed down the hole and then strung out to the uh, trailers, the diagnostic trailers. This was known as ground zero. Once this was all backfilled and covered up, then the, everybody would move off to a control point several miles away from ground zero where then detonation of the device would take place. 
The purpose of the diagnostic tables was, of course, is to measure yield and all kinds of data that the design agency people would interpret as to the quality of their design. Uh, it was very interesting to watch on monitors at the plant, at the control point, once the firing took place, the earth did show a condition just like an earthquake with ripples moving out away from ground, ground zero. And when that would dissipate, then we would wait 15, 20, 25 minutes for what was known as the subsidence. When the device would be detonated, it would create a tremendous underground cavern and that would be stable for 20 or 30 minutes and then eventually it would cave in. And when it did cave in, why it would leave a depression on the surface of the earth 40 or 50 feet deep, depending on the size of weapon or the size of device that was, that was fired. Now, these pictures here are considered as unclassified, unclassified without a title. So I think that we, they're probably going to be acceptable for purposes of, of this tape showing. Um, this was the way of life then from, in my life, from the mid-70s until uh, the late 80s. And uh, there were many shots that went through the, went through the system at that time that uh, they would give them code names. Uh, they get, would get on the, a cheese kick, Brie, uh, American, Roquefort, shots like that. Then they would get on nautical terms like mast, bow, uh, gunnel, so on. They, everybody had this, this list of names in both laboratories. And oftentimes the question was asked, who in the world thinks up all of these names? And when we would ask the design agency guys, they generally said they would generally leave it to their wives to come up with some kind of a name or something like that. Once in a while, you would see a little write-up in the Denver Post about a test shot at Nevada, codenamed such and such. It might not mean anything to most people, but if I read it, it would mean a lot. I knew just exactly the whole history of the, of the, of the shot. Uh, this, uh, this, this kind of thing, you could tell the, just about the pulse of the international atmosphere by the type of device and the type, type of weapon program that you were going through. You would go through a phase of building a devices that you knew were going to end up in ICBMs, international, or in, intercontinental ballistic missiles for submarine warfare, aircraft drop, whatever. Uh, then maybe there would be a group of programs come along that would deal with tactical weapons, uh, mines, using atomic devices, um, artillery guns, and the likes. Which meant, of course, uh, rather than having large-scale war, they were expecting battlefield wars. And that's what made it interesting. Uh, when I worked for Alcoa, it wasn't very exciting just to see a molten pot of aluminum poured into ingot and then shipped off to be processed elsewhere in the country. But at Rocky Flats, you and especially in the product engineering group and the people you associated with in the laboratories, you got a pretty good insight into what was going on in the world. What really made it interesting, uh, aside from the daily routine, you kind of got in on a little extra scoop. In 1959, there was a fire, well there had been fires prior to that, small fires, but in 1959 on Mother's Day, uh, May 15th I believe it was, something like that. 69, right? 69, yes, yes. No, 1950, 69, you're right, 1969. And uh, I had been with the family down visiting my mother in Salida and on the way back picked that up on the radio. And it really upset me because they talked that it was quite an extensive fire 
and uh, they were wondering about the future of the plant, and I was wondering about the future of my job at that time. We all reported for work the next day, as, as usual, and uh, just kind of sat around and waited for management to make a decision about what we were going to do. Uh, the design laboratory people were calling and inquiring, what's the status of our project and what not? And of course, all of this decision making had to be made, uh, we called upon the Hill, Building 111 with the administrative people. But of course, we were concerned about, about c continuing the program. The area that was damaged was the area where our particular product, projects for the devices were being manufactured. So we knew that we were, at least for the time being, out of business. Now, after that, then we all kind of got volunteered by management to participate in the cleanup of building 777. And that was a very interesting uh, activity to where you had to uh, dress up in company clothing, uh, prepare for entering a very contaminated area. You were rigged up to have supplied air in order to get into the area. The first job that they needed to do was the accountability of their fissile material in that building. That necessitated getting into the various glove boxes where this material existed or lived. Um, that entailed uh, taking windows and whatnot off of glove boxes and actually handling the fissile material and passing it on to uh, people outside of the building in another room in production control, bagging it out so that the monitors and whatnot could finish up the bagging and get it accounted for. Uh, it was <laughs> very interesting. We were all kind of on the same radio circuit. We could communicate with production control building or people outside of the building or outside of our immediate part of the building as to what we, where we were, what we were doing. And my, keep in mind that the building was practically dark. All we had is some temporary lighting in the place. So you were kind of feeling your way around in there with water on the floor and hoping that there was no electrical circuit that you might get into with wet feet that would put an end to your career at Rocky Flats. But there were four or five of us all tied together on the same communicating circuit. And one guy had a cold and he had the sniffles. <laughs> and after about six hours, it got a little bit tiresome hearing, you know, through the radio system there. Anyway, after six hours, and that's about the amount of time that you came in there, why then you had to come out and go through the decontamination process, shedding all of your clothing that would eventually be destroyed. You were wringing wet from sweat. And then, of course, you could go to the shower room and whatnot and clean up. Uh, that activity took place in my, my particular contribution to the cleanup process. But there were other people that spent good many hours and time in the building, uh, mopping up, cleaning up, painting hot surfaces and whatnot. That was a place where I first became equated with 409 as a cleaner. For some reason or other, it evidently was a, 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 a cleaning agent that would uh, remove plutonium or allow plutonium to be mopped up in a cloth or rags or something like that to where they could get the activity level, the radioactive level, down far enough to where then they could paint over the surface and get the building back into a livable state and a working state. This process of cleaning up that building, 776 and 777, took several months. I forget now just how long it took, 
but it it really did upset the production facility to the point where it boxcarred down to uh, Amarillo, Texas, where our product would go, and on into various other agencies that, for the most part, were shut down because we were shut down. We were the heart of the whole program there. After several months of cleanup and got the building going again, why, then we were able to get some semblance of production started and getting the design agency people back into business. But that fire did cause a good two years disruption or disturbance in our in our production out there. And there was a lot of hard work, nasty hard work took place in order to get the thing back in, in motion. Can you describe the first time you went into that building after the fire? Oh, it was, it, like? it was eerie. It was eerie when we went into the building. As I say, there was very meager lighting and there was water on the floor from the fire hoses that they had used in the previous day. And you did have a flashlight system. Having been in the building many times prior to the fire, we all knew our way around pretty well. And, uh, but you still, you still knew that you were you were in a real hot atmosphere and without the benefit of supplied air or anything like that if you had to take a deep breath you could almost be assured that you were going to inhale plutonium dust somewhere or another but the company did a good job of exercising all the various safety precautions that possible it I've often thought of other countries and their atomic programs and how they got along, how they developed it. The Dow Chemical Company took on this project, which was never before experienced on a large scale in this country, to build a plant, to build equipment, to hire people, and to train people. And really, when you as I look back, we were all just kind of feeling our way in this business. We were building probably for the whole world a means of handling radioactive materials such as plutonium and uranium in a very confined area under extreme safety requirements and building very specialized equipment to and fixtures to build the device that we had to. As I look back, there were a lot of real genius people that took to the job earnestly, creatively, and really developed an industry that uh, is very unique in American manufacturing. And it's good that we're having this uh, history record the situation so that people will know in the future just what was involved in the building of America's nuclear arsenal. There. Now, uh, the, one, of the, one of the interesting shots, and it was the last one that I was involved in or that the special assembly group that I was in charge of was involved in was known as Kearsarge, and I have a, a cap here. The, it was a Los Alamos project, and the purpose of the project on, on the, the shield here, they would, they would have these hats available for all of their various shots that t took place. Livermore, I don't think, indulged in it. If they did, we never got any of the caps. But on the, on the cap label here is an American flag and a Russian flag. And the name of the project is Kearsarge. And there are Russian words here and American words here. And we asked about the purpose of this particular shot. And it was a joint venture shop. Now, bear in mind that this took place in the late 80s. It was a joint venture between the Russia's, Russians AEC and the American AEC shop. The purpose was to allow the Russian scientists 
I don't know whether they actually witnessed the loading of their device or the Los Alamos device down the hole at, at the Nevada test site or whether they were brought in after all of the ground work was done. But they were allowed instrumentation, seismic instrumentation at, at the test site so that when this device was fired off, they were able to get a signature, seismic signature of a device of this yield. I know what the yield was specified at, but I'm not going to say it here. The American AEC people or Department of Energy scientific people from the laboratories were, by the same token, allowed to witness a similar shot on the Russian property with similar type of instrumentation, seismic instrumentation. The purpose of this is that if we have signed a treaty to stop testing, they have a signature of the kind of testing results, seismic results we get, and we have theirs, so that they can monitor these tests and I'm sure they always do to see if anybody is breaking the treaty and sneaking around the back door and testing weapons. But of course, in 1989, I believe, all of the testing ceased. There is no more underground testing as far as the United States is concerned. There's some talk, I guess, to, uh, to start it up again in Washington. Uh, I don't think it'll fly. I do know this, that without Rocky Flats, it's going to be an expensive undertaking for this country to build the kind of facilities that we now see being destroyed or dismantled out at Rocky Flats. Why is that? Well, I uh, mean, why are they dismantling? Well, you said it's going to be an incredibly expensive oh, undertaking. Yes. Uh, just nothing, nowhere else. Uh, I've kind of kept track with people who have been in on the, the retirement of the plant, and I gather from some of them that the operating procedures that were uh, written up by our technical writing group for the manufacturing and the assembly, a lot of those procedures and the paperwork and things uh, don't exist anymore. So you've got to start all over and do that. I don't, I don't know for sure whether all of that is destroyed, but I have been contacted at times from Los Alamos people uh, over the phone to pick my brains on certain uh, operations. And I would say, don't you have the procedures that we built out here for that? And they said, no, we have not been able to get a hold of them. And I thought, how, how crazy, there must be, they must be somewhere and if they're not, then you're going to start just where we started back in the late 50s and early 60s, having to build, you know, the processes, the equipment, and everything for your particular projects. So the procedures are, could you explain what the procedures are? Yes. About, you know? We have a, had in, the, in our department, we had a technical writing group, and there were they would write up a procedure for the cleaning of the parts using a cleaning agent. <clears throat> step by step, what you had to do, how to test the quality of the, of the uh, uh, cleaning solution, how to handle the part and how to prepare the part to keep it free of any future contamination. You also had manufacturing procedures, a routine to go through to how to set up the numerical controlling machines, the inspection machines for turning out the various contoured parts and whatnot. And, uh, then, and then you had the assembly procedures. We had special equipment that had to be designed from the ground up to do a certain operation. And of course, then the, the, the operator had to that used the equipment had to have some kind of written instruction, step one, step two, step three, and whatnot. This all had to be done in order to guarantee uniformity of the construction of the project. And at the time, all through the process, whether it was in the foundry, whether it was in the manufacturing, the fabrication end of the thing, or whether it was in the assembly, definite record was kept, just as they do 
at Ford Motor Company or General Motors on your automobile so that they know that on this day this product was made, we were following these procedures. The process there is that if there is something later on found out to be faulty in the product that we built, it is important to go back and find out all the product that was built according to that particular procedure on that day in order to tie it down. It could be that those products are at sea somewhere or in aircraft flying around the world, you know, in defense of the country. And if it is a problem that might bear on the workability of the, of the device, then there's got to be a mechanism to bring that product back, retrieve the device, and replace it with a reliable unit. This is done in American industry all the time. The automobile companies recall automobiles. Uh, the guys that build toasters may recall a batch of toasters that were made and have a defective part in it. They do it with kids' toys. It's just a standard manufacturing routine that industry goes through. So these procedures, often referred to, always referred to as M procedures, the assembly of the MC-19 such and such, or the washing procedures for plutonium or uranium parts, uh, the baking and outgassing procedures used. And of course, at the beginning of the book, in front of the book, it told what revisions. From time to time, as we would learn, the book would have to be revised, maybe a sentence, maybe a whole page, maybe the whole book. But that documentation was all maintained so that you knew every day just what procedure was used in building that particular unit. And your work in the project engineering group then was to develop those procedures? Right? Absolutely. That we, had, we had, in the product engineering group, we had the product design group. They're the people that made up all of the drawings that we would reproduce, send out to the various uh, departments. So they didn't come from, the drawings did not come from Lazarus The original or? designs would come from the design agencies okay. according to their, their concept of the part. We would have to translate those drawings into a manufacturing uh -huh. drawing here that fit the way we did business at Rocky Flats. Your machines and that sort The machining of and all that sort of stuff. And of course, those drawings from time to time were revised as we went through the development work and we found out we needed more tolerances here or we could cut down tolerances here or the shape may have to be changed here. And all of these various changes had to be okayed by the design agency. How did you figure out that you needed, I mean, obviously you weren't testing every weapon that went through, right? No, no, uh, when you say testing, we put it through various tests and whatnot, but you're saying, how did we know such and such uh, needed some p particular feature needed changes and tolerances? Hey, that was the experience that the machinists ran into. We had, let me just say for a moment, when this plant started in, set up here in Colorado, we did not have the manufacturing in this state that they had in the Midwest, in the automobile industries, in a variety of industries in the Midwest. So we needed good machinists, people that worked in that kind of industry, and the call went out by the Dow Chemical Company back in the state of Michigan where their home office was, in Wisconsin and places like that, that jobs were going to be available out here. As I've often said to other people, that was a real break for those people back there because they were, and I'm talking about this is in the 50s and maybe a little bit before and on into the 60s, they were able to sell their houses in the Midwest for a pretty good price and come to Colorado, the Denver area, and buy relatively cheap housing and work at wages very comparable to what they were receiving in their industries back in the Midwest. And believe me, we had a real crackerjack bunch of machinists and people like that. I remember one day in Building 44, the superintendent had a meeting, and this would have had to have been probably sometime in the 70s, and he announced to this group of engineers, he said, 
in two years, he said, I will have lost a quarter of my working staff here. That meant these people would be retiring. And he said, I really don't know what I'm going to do for qualified people, real qualified people. And, and it, that was, that was one of the biggest problems that we had. Once that group of people began to retire and move out of the plant, then we had to go looking for machinists and inspectors and people with experience. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a chore. Probably Emily Griffith Opportunity School was about our only source here in Colorado. I'm sure we got people from the Martin plant down south and some other industries. By that time, the state industry, uh, manufacturing industry had started to grow. And so we could latch on to people. But we, in my estimation, never did replace the quality of people that I first experienced back in the early 60s at the plant. The thing that made it outstanding is when you're manufacturing critical parts, if something goes on in the manufacturing process, you have to scrap that part, that adds to the cost of the overall program expense. And I did notice in the 70s, as the experienced people moved on and retired, and we've got more green people into the plant, the scrap rate began to increase, and thereby the cost. But it's the price that Uncle Sam had to pay in order to keep the industry going there. But still in all, supervisory people did their best to try to train the new persons to work at the same skill level of the guy that had left the job. So, now, have you any other questions there? Um, lots. <laughs> All right, shoot. Uh, let me just follow up on that. Um, we had started that, that conversation about the processes by you were saying that in Los Alamos, they can't find the processes. So they, they are trying to manufacture the same exact weapons there, right? That's, well, I, I don't know that they're trying to manufacture it. Uh, I have a nephew that works there, and he kind of keeps me up to date on a few of the scuttlebutt things there. But yes, they have been kind of, of uh, trying to manufacture some of these uh, devices. Uh, they, don't, they don't have the kind of facilities that we have. And I get a kick out of some of the scuttlebutt about their, the way they do business from the standpoint of a safety standpoint. And uh, it certainly doesn't meet the standards that I experienced at Rocky Flats. These operating procedures that I spoke of were sent, copies were sent, of course, to the design laboratories and to their so-called weapons department. And they have the those M procedures, both at Los Alamos and at Livermore, on file, if they've kept them. If they haven't kept them, and we haven't put ours into storage somewhere around here, if this industry is to ever start up again, they're going to start right from rock bottom, which I think is very it's sad, and therefore is going to be very expensive. So In addition, What's that? They'll be reinventing the wheel, basically. Uh, absolutely reinventing the wheel. Then there's the question of personnel. Uh, uh, I, I really, I take a look at some of our young people coming out of high school, colleges, and whatnot, and I'm, I'm not so sure that, you know, with the, uh, the computer industry booming and stuff like that, if anybody really wants to get into this kind of business. It's, it is, it's a business working with hazardous material, but uh, it, it's, it is safe if you follow the rules and the regulations, you know, as, as established by experienced people. I don't know that you're going to find a group of people that would be willing to, to work in this kind of industry. Oh, I suppose if, uh, bear in mind that the, the employment situation was not all that good in the 50s and the 60s, and therefore uh, the, they weren't questioning at that time, you know, uh, the safety and all that sort of stuff. They knew they were coming to an industry that was handling a, a critical uh, material, and, but they needed a job.
And today, if jobs are much more plentiful and perhaps in more exciting industries, you may not find the people so willing to do this. But I never would expect the country to go on a building binge of this product like we experienced in the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. We even used to ask sometime, where in the hell are they, what are they doing with all these things, you know? But um, when you get the leader of the government running on a ticket of, of uh, national defense, uh, and he's got the purse strings, he can just about do anything that he wants. So, any more questions? Well, um, so I'm, I'm judging from what you're saying, that do, do you think it was a mistake to close Rocky Flats then? Uh, yes and no. Y yes uh, or no. The, the, when I came here, Rocky Flats was really out in the woods, as many people will attest, out in the flats there, a long way. Now, civilization has built up all around the plant. And no, it is not the proper location you know, for the, uh, handling that kind of food. Because we were always under constant scrutiny uh, and, and a lot of bum publicity in the newspapers about leaks of contaminated material, you know, and all that sort of stuff. A lot of us out there just laughed out for the most part. But it was editorializing by the newspapers as to this big bad plant and the product it was building. And now you've got all this population around. It's not a good, good place. But I think the dismantling of the plant in such a rapid motion there, and from what I can gather, not much thought giving to ever starting an industry like this again is, is a is a mistake. If somebody wants to start this program, and I'm talking about our government officials, the president, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, and these people here feel in a need for a new, a new generation of atomic weaponry. I hope they don't. I would like to see everybody give it up, destroy it. Uh, we breakfast people get together and talk about weapons of mass destruction and we kind of giggle at the term and remark that we know where ours are but I don't think George Bush knows where his are <laughs> so or sat down with those people well that's neither here nor there so any other questions um, so following up on that question um, or on your comments how did you feel in general about working in a plant that produced a key Never, never, never had a, never had a uh, doubt in my life, in my life that what I was doing was critical to the national defense program at that time. Uh, I never felt real unsafe because I could firsthand witness. Uh, the largest department on the plant was health physics. They were interested in maintaining my health and welfare and everybody else's. So you went through the routine of peeing in the bucket and wearing your dosimetry badge and all that sort of stuff there. And they, if you played by the rules and, and followed their precautions and whatnot, uh, I'm sure that there, my father worked on the railroad uh, for 30 years and he used to tell me of very bad accidents and where people got killed and yet the railroads were strong on safety. But still in all, they were having some bad times and they still have bad times with railroad wrecks and that's the same way with any, any industry. But no, I never, I never hesitated in the least uh, from a safety standpoint or from a, just a uh, moral standpoint that uh, I was doing the wrong thing. I've had people tell me that I was doing the wrong thing morally but, you know, that was their opinion. And how did you respond? Or how did oh, you, feel? Uh, the, the, you know, I, I, I try to avoid any real argument. He's entitled to his opinion. I'm entitled to mine. If I could reassure him in any way that uh, this, this uh, device or this project was uh, safe, I would do that. 
as to whether we as a nation should have it. Uh, I never hesitated to say, of course, if the other guy's got it, we've got to have it. That's all there is to it. And it, it's a, it is a kind of a case of chicken, you know, who's, and I think we, we won. See? Um, you discussed um, peeing in the bucket. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, were, were, any of you, were you or any of your coll close colleagues um, exposed to either contamination or beryllium solvents? Yes, um, I, I wasn't personally. I, I never had, uh, I, I had had some contamination on my gloves or something like that at times, but nothing that ever jeopardized my well-being or anything like that. But there were times in the plant when there was some, well, if they were going to work on a piece of machinery that was contaminated, they would build a tent of plastic around the tent, plastic sheeting, so that they could work within there and, and uh, they would work on the machine with supplied air and things like that. And there were a time or two when some welding spark or something like that caught the tent on fire and it, it burned up, you know, and everybody got out of the way. But what it would do, it of course, would, would liberate perhaps some plutonium dust. Anybody in the area then had, was suspect as being exposed. And of course, they had to be checked out by monitors. And I did have a, a couple of employees who worked with, you know, Come out, come out of the building in a hurry, naturally, and back into our office area. <clears throat> and, and one guy in particular was, I think he was laughing, but it was a hysterical laugh, you know, because he had not experienced anything like this. And he was telling me about this fire and whatnot. My immediate response was, were you near it? And he said, yes. I said, stand still, don't move, till I call a monitor. And we got a monitor into the building <clears throat> and told him the story, checked the guy over it. Yes, the guy was contaminated. He'd, and he had walked out of the building and through into our building in our office area. And we had some hot spots where he had walked. He had gone to his desk and touched the paperwork. And yes, we had contamination on the drawings and the paperwork. <laughs> Unfortunately, he had gone by the secretary's desk, a real nice little gal there, touched the desk or something like that, so it was necessary for the monitor to check the, the secretary over with the wand, you know, all over the surface of, of her to see that she had not picked up contamination. She had never been exposed to this kind of environment, you know, or this kind of a routine. And so she was not only petrified, she was embarrassed <laughs> about the monitor having to rub the monitor, the, his wand, so to speak, over her body and whatnot like that. Everybody kind of got a kick out of it, but to her it was no laughing matter. And of course it created a, a bit of real concern and we had had to do some talking to kind of calm her down that she was not contaminated. But yes, those two guys in that particular instance had to go to body count and go through the body count deal, and they had to use the pea bucket routine, so to speak, for 30 days. They are forever a record, you know, have a record of this episode on their, their employment history. Uh, they've left the plant, one guy left the plant a long time ago, and I'm sure that the health physics department said, keep us informed of your whereabouts so that we can, if necessary, call you back for a re-examination in the body count situation. So had they gotten some in their lungs? I, 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 I don't know exactly where their contamination was, but if it was, why then it could pass through the body eventually, you know, in the man's urine. Uh, they had a program, they still have a program, it's known as the Transuranium Registry. It's operated by a uh, group at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, the state of Washington. And if you wanted to be a party to the program, and I was from almost the time I began to work in that kind of an environment, then I would subscribe to it and sign an agreement that if I, whenever I died, why then they, I, my spouse would be uh, would 
allow an autopsy, autopsy of my lungs and vital organs that they would like to look at. She would have to authorize that. And they would be sent off to the, to the laboratories in the, in, up in the state of Washington to see if I had any contamination in me. This was a maintenance of history of employees that lived there. Not everybody joined uh, to be a party to it. And then peri periodically, every five years, you would re-up, re so to speak, and resign and become a part of the program, and I did. And I was only notified really last fall that I was taken off the program at a person near 80 and no problems of any kind. I no longer am a subject you know, to keep track of. But they have built a history throughout the laboratories and the various plants of people who have worked in this kind of an environment and what kind of illnesses, you know, they have experienced. Cancer, briliosis, and that sort of thing there. And you would get a report periodically as a member. Annually, you'd get a report letting you know just what you know, their history gathering had done in the past year. And I'm happy to say that really, according to their report, the cancer f problems from this kind of industry were no different than in the country as a whole. So this is not to say that some guys perhaps got cancer from uh, exposure. I know some of my friends have passed along and it's highly suspect that in the work and where they work, they may have, you know, contacted cancer. But the rate, the overall rate in four to 6,000 people that worked at that plant was no different than four to 6,000 people in the general population there. So anyway, I'm not a part of it anymore, so I don't have to be autopsied. <laughs> really fair way, probably. <laughs> So, um, so do you, the pub, you mentioned the sort of the media editorializing about safety. Did, did you feel that the public um, sense that Rocky Flats was a dangerous place to work? Oh, Channel 7 had a man working for it by the name of Minshaw. And he would appear on television every once in a while. He was invited to the plant on certain occasions and shown some, some of the processes, uh, nothing very classified. And when he got on television, <laughs> I always felt that he would do a little bit of editorializing. Uh, that's the media aspect of the business to embellish a bit about this plant and that plant. And of course, it stirs up the whole area around here. I, I would, my neighbor across the street would see it on television, would ask me questions about it. And I'd kind of brush it off as just so much, you know, uh, bull, so to speak. But I couldn't convince him. They, they, they were very strongly anti-Rocky Flats plant in there. But uh, yeah, the, the media uh, kept at it. And that's, that's another thing why it's good that the plant moved out of this area here. That makes for good headlines if you can say something about Rocky Flats. Well, they won't have Rocky Flats to kick around anymore. You know, it's all defunct and gone. Best that it be located out in the middle of the desert in Nevada or Utah or someplace like that where there's not a population, great population and whatnot around. Okay, we're uh, almost at an hour, so I'm going to stop okay. and change tapes. Cold War Museum Oral History Project. I'm speaking with Ed McNamara. My name's Hannah Nordhaus, and it is the 23rd of January, 2004. Um, and Ed is going to talk about the social life and social programs. Yeah. Yes, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the various social programs at Rocky Flats. It wasn't all work. Uh, they did uh, uh, have a, a safety program that had a reward uh, feature to it. And I have here something that people will recognize is a little radio uh, award for, and let me pull it out here, it says on the back, 
This is a safety award by the Rocky Flats Dow Chemical Plant, 15,000 man hours, September the 18th, 1961. Uh, best AEC and Dow record. And they passed these things all out to everybody. This still works if you put batteries in it. The only thing you can get is KOA down, downtown. But uh, I've had it around here. It even survived falling in the, to the toilet at one time, and it still, still works. But the, the safety program would, from time to time, as they accumulated uh, a new record of hours, they would give a, offer a gift or a selection of gifts. And people received a hard side, the Samsonite luggage. Uh, they finally went into a coupon program where they, you could accumulate so many coupons, go up to the warehouse, and they had a variety of uh, tools and things like that. You could cash in your coupons for an electric drill or a sledgehammer or something like that. They also would put on a safety dance, uh, sponsored dance at one of the country clubs, Lakewood Country Club specifically, that's where most of them took place. And uh, it was an affair for employees and their wives, sweethearts and whatnot. And uh, they were great, there were dances, nice dinners. It was a very good social evening. And that, uh, that program prevailed as long as, as long as I worked there. In addition to that, why the uh, yeah, the employees organization, I forget what they called it now, but in the summertime, why then they would hire or rent for the day either the Elitch Gardens facility or the uh, Lakeside facility where you could take your family and uh, go and spend the day, have a picnic and do all the rides and good Lord, uh, my kids even to this day still speak about the uh, the Dow Days, and you know, we refer to them as the Dow Day program. I don't think that program was, it might have been continued under Rockwell, uh, but uh, it certainly was under Dow, and it was a very good way to, uh, you know, get people acquainted with various departments and whatnot. So it wasn't all nails and hammer and work and, and machining and everything like that, and they did try to bring in as much as possible uh, various uh, uh, members of the family so that you felt like that the people at the plant was a family. And it was. It was a very, very strong family atmosphere among people. It kind of tapered off later on as the, we got a younger generation of people. They didn't feel too inclined to, to really partake in it. But in the, during the 60s and the 70s, it was a pretty strong operation. We, I have some pictures here of, of guys that worked for me, and, and uh, they, they got service awards. A uh, man by the name of Kinzer was head of the, the uh, product engineering department, Jim Dale, and myself here, where he's getting some kind of an award for service pin. And uh, Bob Pentico, also uh, a man that worked for me, getting an award. A group of my engineers sitting around having a discussion and uh, um, some people is a little boy by the name of Singer unfortunately died very young and I forget what this gentleman's name was and this guy's name here was uh, oh gosh uh, I, I forget what his name was but anyway these were some of the things that we that we did uh, have a picture here uh, we had a management club organization, and uh, <clears throat> we would have, it was just for people in management, but we would have our dinners at various places, either uh, in the Lakewood, Arvada area, or in Boulder, or up in Louisville, and places like that. We would generally have a, a guest speaker, and in this particular night, why I had the pleasure of presenting a thank you award to, to uh, Johnny Rawson, who was coach of the Denver Broncos at that particular time. I think it was in the 70s. And so I, I was given copies of the picture since I was in the thing, and I will turn these over to the museum here one of these days. Have a group picture here uh, taken during the Rockwell era. And uh, these for people that made suggestions, various suggestions uh, on safety and the likes, and the uh, suggestion program. And here was one group that was presented with uh, various awards and whatnot. So.
anyway, this will all be turned over to to the Rocky Flash Museum one of these days, and uh, I'll work with uh, Don Rolfe on that. Okay, thank you. Um, you had mentioned the family atmosphere and how nice it was to be able to bring your family to these events. Um, what was it like to not be able to talk about your work to your family? Oh, it, it wasn't a burden. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, my kids were little. They wouldn't have understood what I was talking about, you know, my wife would have, uh, and we were talking about this particular question the other day, and she said, it, it really was a laugh, you know, you couldn't talk it at home, but she said, we could pick up the Denver Post every morning, you know, and read something about Rocky Flats and whatnot, uh, and, but we couldn't talk about it at home here. But uh, it, it wasn't a burden. Uh, one of my first supervisors back in the early 60s was talking about this sort of thing, about you know, the security and talk. Uh, Ralph uh, Miller was his name. He was head of the product definition department. And we were talking about it and he, he kind of laughed and he said, now, if anybody asks you about what we do at Rocky Flats, just tell them we make compressed horse manure. And he said, uh, that, should, that should be sufficient and whatnot. And I pulled it off several times and people would look at me and walk off. and. They would, sometimes they would voice an opinion as to what a terrible place it was, this, that, and the other thing, but you, you just had to brush it off, you know. They didn't know what I knew, and so there was no use arguing about it. Okay. Um, was it odd when you first came to Rocky Flats to be in such a high security environment? Yeah, you know, I had a Q clearance. Um, it's one of the higher security clearances that are issued by the Department of Energy. Uh, had access to very classified technical drawings, uh, written procedures, documentation, uh, letters and whatnot. Uh, and uh, so, but it, it yeah, it, it did impress upon you the, 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 the nature of the work if you had had any understanding or learning of the Rosenberg affair that took place down in Los Alamos there, uh, and there are some, some good stories about that activity, why you, you know the importance of keeping your mouth shut, so to speak. And of course, in the Navy, in the, in the submarine service, they refer to it as the silent service. You didn't talk about where you were going or what you had done in the line of sinking ships or anything. You just kind of kept it to yourself. So it kind of fit in. I was already somewhat experienced in that in the nature of a business there. And what about um, dealing with having stuff classified and uh, having yes. gone through all those hoops? Was that uh, difficult ever? You were, as a supervisor, you were assigned every classified document that came into your department was signed to you then you would reassign it to one of your engineers. And of course, periodic inventories had to be taken. The, this, the assignment was a receipt system that you had to sign for, and you had to obey by the, the handling rules. In other words, that document had to be under lock and key, so to speak. And uh, we, uh, so anyway, each individual engineer had documents assigned to him and my secretary from time to time would have to go around and in, and do an inventory each individual engineer and check up the documents when I retired and left why then I could not retire completely until every document that had been assigned to me was accounted for and so you got a pretty good understanding of just how stuff was protected Early on in the, in the game, they had a classification of confidential and secret, and then a need to know type of thing. But Jimmy Carter changed that during his administration to, and they dropped off the confidential uh, classification for two reasons. Number one, it, you would have a habit if you created a document that you weren't really sure of, you'd probably just put confidential on it for you know, just to protect. When in doubt, you, you, you don't do the dumb thing. That stuff had to be controlled, it had to be stored properly, it added to the cost of maintaining documentation. And therefore, they did away with it and you had to go to a reviewer, a, a security reviewer, 
uh, to, if you had a letter or a report or something like that, and they would go through it and, and see if the subject matter was such that had to be protected, and if it did, why then it had the secret uh, stamp on the thing, and it became a controlled document. Uh, one of the hazards, if the next one on a distribution list uh, was in another building, I would have to hammer this to my engineers, don't mail it yourself. Take it back to the secretary so she can make out the property uh, transfer receipts. And then it would be assigned to the next supervisor, it cleared here. Early in my game, I forwarded one on to a guy in another building in an inner plant envelope that had holes in it. And of course when it got to him, and he could see the red striping in there, he knew that he had received by conventional mail a classified document. That's a security infraction. He was a good friend, so he just kind of brought the document back up to me secretly, and we went through the process. But it only happened once, and I learned the lesson how to do that sort of thing there. So yes, uh, uh, and of course, uh, the conversations that you had with the design agency people not only on the production program, but on the, the Nevada testing program, you got a lot of very classified skinny, so to speak, that you didn't talk about, but you had the privilege of knowing about it, which made you feel pretty important, if I might say, that, uh, that, that the information was really known to a limited number of people. So. The, um I've heard someone had told me that um, there were instances where you might produce a document and then give it to the classifier, and then it was classified at a higher level than your clearance. So you they could, could. The, own, the document that you would produce. They they could. It it was up to them. the The highest level that we worked with out here was just secret. Mm -hmm. Yes, if it, in the earlier days when confidential was a classification, they might look it over and say, no, this, this contained enough sensitive information that we've got to classify it as secret. Yeah, so then it would have to be upgraded there. But that, uh, that was, I had a couple of occasions where guys uh, went out to California to deliver more plant on uh, an exchange program, and in packing up all their stuff, they happened to have a classified document there that was picked up by security at the Livermore plant. And of course that rebounded then back to the Rocky Flats plant and it rebounded back to Ed McNamara. You know, and there was lots of hell to pay in the, you know, uh, explanations and whatnot. Such kind of infractions, depending on the circumstances, did affect your performance review, did affect your salary, you know, progression that sort of thing there. We just would not tolerate careless handling. And I saw, you know, many cases like that and that it was a constant worry to keep your employees informed of the responsibility that they had and to follow the rules and you won't get into trouble. Um, when you first came to Rocky Flats, when did you first figure out what Rocky Flats did? When did I first, oh, I spoke of a, a friend of mine that I went to high school with, grew up with in Slide and whatnot. He got a degree in chemical engineering, or chemistry, I guess it was, University of Denver, and he went to work for Dow Chemical when they just broke ground. As a matter of fact, they sent him to Y-12 uh, down in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, for some preliminary work to acquaint him with what his work would be like at Rocky Flats. And then he came back to the Denver area and went to work at, uh, at, at the plant out there. And of course, he would s say a few things. We'd talk about it. I was not an employee at the time, so I really, you know, was not entitled to any of the information. But he just spoke about the plant in general. And he liked, as a native living in Colorado, although he did complain about the condition of the highways going out there, because it would cost him probably a tire a month, you know, with the chuck holes and everything, because really it was pretty primitive out there on the old Rocky Flats, and boy, there's no place in the country that has winds like Rocky Flats. It could really howl out there. As a matter of fact, I remember days when they would string a, a rope from the, 
the main administration building out into the parking lot so they could hold on to it. Little little uh, gravel pits flying around, hitting windshields and, and windows in your car and shattering them, literally shattering the thing. So it was, it was pretty hostile territory to work in there. But that's how I got next to Rocky Flats. And then, of course, when I came back from Wenatchee one time and had made up my mind that I was going to get out of the aluminum business, and I happened to run on to Herb Bowman at a Colorado CU football game up here. And uh, he said, why don't you put in an application, come out to plant on Monday and, and let's, let's talk it over. And so I did, and that's how I got started. And so you knew at that point that they were producing? Oh yes, I knew what, yeah. I, I, then I had a pretty good idea of what. And the, the thing about it is that, that, yes, I was hired pending, of course, security clearance. And I was forewarned by the employment office that uh, you will be investigated, your family and whatnot, up there in the state of Washington, and no doubt people that you work for, your supervisors and whatnot. So it's up to you, meaning me, to inform my employer that I had an intent to leave the deal. And they said, it may jeopardize your employment at that place, but we will try to accommodate you here in case your employer decides, well, if you're going to quit, you might as well quit right now, instead of waiting for another six weeks or two months for your clearance to come through. So it was known to various guys at the Alcoa plant that I was planning on, on moving. But Alcoa was very generous. I stayed on the job until my clearance came through, and, and uh, I, I thanked them for that. So how, um, when you got to work, how was it uh, different as a workplace? There? Oh, it's very much. It, it, I entered the facility engineering group out there, which was at that time station building 111, <coughs> and it was very much like the uh, facility engineering plant or department there at Alcoa. The terminology and the, all of that sort of stuff, maintenance of buildings, air conditioning systems and the like, was very much. Then, uh, while I was in that department, got transferred down to Building 71 where they were processing chemical material and got an opportunity to go out into the hot area, so to speak, dress up with your, your smock and your booties and your hat and whatnot in the cautionary, don't touch anything, you know, because it's a hot area. Then I began to really learn this is what the manufacturing business is all about in the buildings that you have been designing or working in. So then, then uh, when I finally transferred over into that, that department there, then I got an indoctrination from the supervisory uh, supervisors in the assembly plant. This is a pit. This is what we build here. You know, this is our end product. And that was my introduction then to the, the real meat of the business out there. Um, so what would a typical day have been like for you once you, say, once you got into the... Oh, 21? you know, uh, always rode in a carpool. Uh, that was really uh, one of the worthwhile uh, experiences to ride with people, four or six people. Um, they, a lot of them were the machinists several of the machinists, uh, either in the manufacturing plants or in maintenance and whatnot. And of course, coming home, some of them would talk about what went on that day. Maybe it was a bitch or a gripe. Others, I would they'd say, we've left the plant, forget it. You know, we're going home. <laughs> but yes, a typical day, is you didn't have to clock in, like I did have to at, at uh, the Alcoa plant. And you just started your day where you had left off the day before, you know, on working the project. People to contact, be it here locally or at the design agency, we're going to look at this problem and that problem. You, you had your work all outlined for you. And you were in an office area? You, oh. you didn't have to go into the hot area to go to work? Oh, uh, the office, um, office area was right next in adjacent to the hot area. And yes, uh, it many times it necessitated putting on your smock and your your rug. Uh, clothing, your booties and things, what not to protect your own your own clothing, to go back into the hot area to witness something that was being done on your program. So yes, uh, it was an in and out situation like that. Uh, I used to do it just to learn something. You could learn an awful lot by talking to the people on the floor about what, what they were doing 
and whatnot. So it was part of an educational process. And as I got employees, after I became a supervisor, I encouraged them to go to these various buildings and, and ask questions. Those guys are very willing to tell you what they're doing, how they're doing it. And you can learn a lot just by talking to the various people out there. It's a part of your education in and above what we do right here in the office as far as paperwork and plans and drawings and procedures and that sort of thing. So that was the way, that's the way it was. Um, so if you were handed a blueprint and told to rebuild the various buildings at Rocky Flats using those blueprints, would there be a lot of changes um, that had been made over the years that we wouldn't see in the blueprint? Um, <clears throat> no, I really didn't get that much involved in 18 months in that particular department. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been through that with Alcoa and the biggest problem that you'd run into is that some maintenance guy would put a valve in someplace without contacting the engineering people first. And if that wasn't down on a drawing somewhere, you could run into problems. If there was some system shut down and you wondered what was it in the building that was shutting down this system you know and you were tracing it out on the drawing valves and this that and the other thing only to find out oh here's a valve it's not on the drawing how to get there and the maintenance guy did it as part of his job he didn't follow the routine to let you know to upgrade your drawings that couldn't and did not happen working with the product N nobody on the production floor would make a change to anything, couldn't authorize a change unless they contacted the program engineer. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't authorize any changes until he contacted the design agency. And we did that by teletype. We sent out a proposed change. He would review it, he would okay it, send it back. Then I could take that change authorization to the product definition or the people that made the blueprints, the drawings, so to speak. They would institute the change and then the change would be distributed out into the plant. Once the drawing, new drawings with the change was incorporated, all old drawings had to be returned back to the product engineering department. So these were drawings just for the processes of, of right. particular manufacturing? Staff. That's right. That was the way the system worked, okay. but no changes. Oh, there would be, somebody would do something funny once in a while, you know, that, that might kind of rock the boat, you find somebody. So the quality control people were constantly on the prowl, so to speak, observing procedural operations to see following if the operator was doing a certain operation, he was following the book, to see that he was following the procedure as established there. Mm -hmm. And of course, if he wasn't, why then the, the quality control people would talk to his supervisor about it. They would also report the, the discrepancy to the product engineer for that particular product, if it was, uh, you know, for a pit or something like that, but it had to be closely controlled. There were some situations that we got into that uh, uh, where we, we, we had a problem with the, our particular product that got out into the field and it, it reverberated all the way to the user meaning, say, a submarine or an air base that questioned the quality of our product. That kind of problem went all the way to Albuquerque, and I'm sure it went to Washington. And the, our management really didn't approve of that kind of conduct. Sometimes some butt had to be kicked or some head would roll, you know. Thing. And you could understand the seriousness of the thing. There how were... Would they, how would they figure out something was wrong with that? Oh, oh, you would, uh, it, it, it would be taken up, maybe, maybe the quality control people would pick it up if it happened in this plant, or if a plant downstream reported some kind of a problem. The product, when it was manufactured by Dow or Rockwell, then it was submitted to the Department of Energy and their inspection group. And the, plant, the part did not leave our plant unless the Department of Energy bought it, you see. It had to meet all the requirements there. Once it got through being bought, then it was authorized to be shipped to that plant. So if there was a problem out there, then the Department of Energy here people, they 
they also became a part of the of the problem you see and I, I worked with very closely very closely with the with the uh, acceptance what they call the product acceptance group of the Department of Energy there were some real 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 good guys there and they would work with you they would press you for uh, compliance with specifications and whatnot then there were arguments and debates and we would have to sometimes get the design agency people to come in and explain the situation they were the arbiter they were the guy that made the decision they were the ones that would have to tell the Department of Energy they had to it's acceptable to us it will work thereby clearing us or if they agreed with the Department of Energy then it fell back on us that we screwed up somewhere you see but quality control was a big thing in the plant and I met a lot of good guys in quality control very knowledgeable that kept us out of hot water lots of times um, if, so if a worker wanted to change a, a certain process he would have to talk to his supervisor who would talk to you guys who would talk to the design agencies and how it worked yes if he if he had a recommendation for a change or he had a particular problem he had to bring it up with his supervisor and then my engineer or myself if I was heading the project we had to talk it all over if I thought it was legitimate and it was profitable improvement something like that then I would say yes I'll carry the ball from here and talk to the design agency people either today or when they come in the next time and uh, we'll we'll iron the thing out but yes we encouraged the guy on the floor to give us hints about where we can improve the processes and uh, there was a good cooperation between the man on the floor and these were union people but they were very cooperative with the salaried people in doing their job yes um, so you, you were were you ever a member of the union or? no no I was always salaried and what were your was your experience with the union very good very good my uh, uh, my father was a union man and uh, I had uh, <coughs> worked at Alcoa not as a union man with a lot of union people so I you know they have a point of view they have a, a, a reason for for being union and organized and I respected that and uh, we never I never had any not, never had any problem with them what you so you came you, your degree was in engineering yes mechanical engineering mechanical, okay. mm -hmm. so Okay, um, so you had told me uh, your story about um, the arrest of Sister Pat, and uh, <laughs> yeah. I was hoping you would tell me that on tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, they, th these two nuns got into the plant and they made their statement by throwing blood on the, the f fence that surrounded the production, assembly production facilities. And of course, the uh, the, they had to sh come through the gate without showing a badge so the guards at the east gate notified security that an unauthorized car entered the plant and was somewhere <laughs> so um, yes uh, there was there was a there was a, an arrest and there was a trial and I think they did some jail time over it uh, <laughs> I had a, a good friend <clears throat> that they would periodically have a test where they would signal closing the east gates. So you had to approach, approach the gates cautiously, not race right through them, just so that the guard could see the badge. And periodically they would have a test and they would close the gates, <laughs> you know. And my friend's pickup got caught in the gate one day. <laughs> And he got a rap on his head and whatnot, and I would razz him a little bit about it. And he said, I don't know why he picked on me. He said, I wasn't wearing a, a garb like a nun or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, that, that was the, and, and of course, we had several of those kind of situations going on, you know, and uh, the plant access by the railroad had a spur line out there by 93, and I think it still is there. And, um, there was a protest group build a teepee over the track one time not to pre prevent trains from coming into the plant well 
you know, one blow of the whistle of a big diesel engine and you're going to tear the teepee down right away and get out of the way there. They used to start rumors about various kids from Boulder and whatnot coming out and camping on the tracks and they would start a rumor that, you know, the rattlesnakes are very prominent out in this part of the country so be cautious careful along the tracks because they lay along the tracks and they would talk up this rattlesnake story to where it discouraged some of the protesters from, <laughs> from coming out and doing duty and whatnot. But uh, there was a Buddhist monk that would come out and camp just outside the compound there and beat on his drum and whatnot, you know. The people just took it with a grain of salt and of course there was always some stories <laughs> that would spring up or wise remarks about the whole situation. Some people really took it, you know, to heart seriously uh, and get all excited about it. And I didn't ever see that it was anything to really get excited about. And we had a job to do, just go and do it and so on, you know. They, it, they had their privilege to camp if they wanted to. Did you feel um, insulted in any way or disrespected or? Oh! You know, uh, yeah, <laughs> when my kids got in high school and got wise to this kind of activity going on there, then they would kind of question and maybe be a little bit critical, but not so. They knew where their bread and butter was coming from, you know. But it was, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I remember the day when they tried to encircle the entire plant, you know, with uh, protesters there. And I drove out just out of curiosity and I regret it because I got into the damnedest traffic jam I ever got into my life, you know, that all, everybody rubbernecking watching this episode go on there. But uh, I, I didn't get involved. I just let it go with that. Um, you had mentioned that, that your daughter knew one of the nuns. Um, oh, yes. As a, as a Catholic, was having a portion of the Catholic community so opposed to the plant, was that difficult in any way? That didn't bother me. You know, it didn't bother me one bit. Uh, I don't know, uh, Charlie Bogard and a lot of Catholics <laughs> were employed out there and we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't, it didn't make any difference in our attitude and opinion toward, toward the whole thing. So, sure, it has a moral aspect to the thing, but what the heck, you know, uh, does not, we didn't feel that we were being immoral about, the, about working in, in that kind of an environment. So you had just, um, <laughs> Part of the story that you told that you didn't repeat this time was about being in the parking lot and uh, having all the cars come in. Oh, the, the, uh, all the, the guard force? Yeah, when the, when the yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I, I thought maybe I was the one that, <laughs> that they were after, you know. <laughs> and then when they descended on these two women, why, you had to wonder, I, what the hell's going on, you know? So you had just pulled up and the two women were in the parking lot. The same oh, they were, they were in the parking lot and they were throwing this blood or whatever it was on the fence, you know, when the, when the, the guard force surrounded them and, and took them off to the, the security department there. And I didn't know who they were, you know, I had no knowledge of it. Well, it scuttlebutt will then really come out, you know, who it was and whatnot. And uh, big grape frying, just like a, a prison, the rumors would spread. Did, um, did you participate in any of the, um in the, wasn't there a pro-Rocky Flats rally as well? Oh, uh, there would be a counter <laughs> protest, so to speak, by people. But no, I, I didn't uh, participate in it. I'm, I'm not much for that kind of rah-rah stuff, you know. Um, you had, I, I have this question about security at the site. And, uh -huh. uh, I, was, I didn't know, you had asked me about it, if you, were you comfortable with security at the oh. site? Did you have any, any Thing to add to that? No, no, no. Uh, it, it was a condition of employment. You know, you just accepted it. So, uh, no, I, I never had. Uh, Ed Young was the uh, guy that started out in product engineering with me, but he eventually became head of security. You know, and I used to have a chit chat with him every once in a while, you know, about uh, secure things, not. Uh, you had to continue to impress upon your employees the, the need for adhering to security regulations. I had one employee 
that had uh, congestive heart problems that he had to go to the university hospital one time <clears throat> for some kind of a test where they were going to use a radioactive tracer on him. And so I, I cautioned him, when you return, stop at the east gate and tell the people that you've had this tracer so that when you go, they will nullify or silence their alarms so that you can get to the gate without setting setting the whole alarm system on the plant there. Well, he forgot all about that. <laughs> and he came back to the plant, showed his badge, went on through, and of course the alarms went off. Security descended upon him and whatnot. And finally they got it all ironed out as to what was the reason for triggering of the alarm. And he came into my office kind of giggling, laughing about the whole thing, and I I had to admit that I kind of had to laugh, but I knew that my supervisor would call me because I hadn't informed him, but I had informed him. But that's part of supervision. You just had to, had to take it. But it was necessary that they knew about the alarm system. They also knew, you know, that the man would be passing that out of his body into the sanitary sewer system. And at the sanitary sewer processing plant, east of the plant, had detectors that would pick this up. And they had to know, you know, that it was because somebody had had that put into his body for a, a physical test and not some process in the plant, people that were throwing hot material, so to speak, into the sanitary sewer system. Because those were two separate systems. Process fluids went into holding ponds. And then, of course, they had the regular sewer system. Um, since we're talking about things being thrown out, um, obviously you were gone before the FBI raid. Yes. Yes, I left in 88, and I was not a part of the FBI raid. I followed it in the paper. I talked to some people, you know, that had work, got there working at the time. <coughs> and I don't know. I guess I could <laughs> venture an opinion. I thought it was maybe a little bit overdone or whatnot, but I don't know that much about it, so I guess that's all I have to say about it. Okay. Um, what, um, I, I don't know if you were already at the plant when, um, when women came to work in, on the lines in large numbers, but- Yes, were, that, that all became a part uh, as a result of federal legislation to equal opportunity employment. And heretofore, women on the plant were secretarial, you know, clerks and secretarial people. And uh, very seldom you ever saw them in a hot area or anything like that. And of course, my, my first experience was when uh, I hired one of the first women engineers in the, the first woman engineer in the product engineering department and had to inform her that she would be, her job would carry her out into the contaminated area and whatnot. And so had to go through the instructions, how to conduct yourself, this, that, and the other thing. And she was already fairly uh, acquainted with that, having worked down in Building 71. You had to ask them if they were pregnant, you know, that kind of a question that I wouldn't ask them otherwise, mm -hmm. because, you know, if so, we didn't want them out there. But yes, the, uh, the women then began to move off into the production areas at better, much better salaries than they were getting as clerical people and whatnot. And I was all for it. I said, great, had a very good secretary one time and she just said to me one day, I need the money. And I said, go your best, sign the, sign the, the sheet and, and go to work for them. Some of them had to join the union and some didn't, depending on what uh, group that they went into. But yeah, there were a lot of them and uh, they worked in glove boxes and they worked in processing and they did just the same kind of jobs that the men did and took their responsibilities and job very serious. And yes, uh, before I left, I had hired three different engineers and they were all very, good, knowledgeable people. One, one woman, young girl, that had worked at Martin Marietta and whatnot, who was an engineer, and she was very sharp. And I've recently 
contacted her and she's happily married, living on a ranch up in Wyoming. And we laugh about the kind of environment that we both left, you know. But yeah, they were, they were, they were good engineers. So. Were there any issues, um, it sounds like the plant was built sort of for men, the shower, there were, you know, initially, oh. sex showers, laundry. Oh, was, oh yes, that, kind of that uh, uh, yes, once the women got into the production areas, then of course there had to be accommodations for showering and, and whatnot. Yes, when I went to work there, uh, there was a very, very tight control on where women went and worked around the plant. It was generally an office area. Uh, I look back now, there was only one colored man in the whole plant, you know. And once the federal law stipulated, you know, that, that you cannot discriminate in any way against the individual, then we begin to pick up many, many more minorities. And they were all, all good, good working people. And then, of course, uh, as I said, with the machinists and the older crew beginning to retire and a new bunch coming in, yes, you could notice the difference you know, a lot in attitudes, work attitudes and things like that with a newer group of people. You knew you were getting old when it bothered you. <laughs> you know, you'd been there too long. Yeah. So, and there weren't any issues with minorities coming in in terms of people? Oh, the usual malarkey, you know, that you see in any civilian life there. Uh, but uh, it was a way of life. It was the law, you know, and, and uh, people got used to it. They accepted it. Not, so. All right, well, I'm, um, I think I'm out of questions. Well. So, um, is there anything? you would like to add? Well, no, in summary, I just said that I, I uh, uh, enjoyed the, the time at the plant, bought this house, raised a family, uh, met a lot of great, great people, uh, wouldn't trade the experience for anything. And in retirement, I still, I'm able to keep in contact with a lot of people, you know, and talk about uh, the old days and the happenings um, there was uh, one particular guy by the name of Bobby Thornhill that was quite disfigured at birth and he was a clerk and probably one of the finest guys I ever met out there. Uh, good natured, uh, very cooperative. Uh, he was always the brunt of a lot of jokes and things and he could give as well as he could take. And if I were to ever write a, a story for uh, uh, what is it, Reader's Digest, most unforgettable character would be about him. He was a very nice guy. But there were a lot of them, a lot of great guys. Wouldn't, wouldn't change it for the world. So, so I guess there's one question I forgot to ask, which is if, what were the best and worst things about working there? Well, <laughs> uh, well, the best thing was, of course, this proximity. You were in Colorado, okay. and you, you can't beat that. And, uh, oh, the worst thing might have been that, uh, uh, you know, the, the routine after a good many years of getting up and I, I didn't think that, that when I retired that, that I wondered what I would do, you know, after I retired, but I finally got to the point where I had a house down in Salida and I had this house and if you have two houses and yards to maintain, you soon begin to ask yourself, how did I ever find time to go to Rocky Flats to work? I had my hands full. And, and I fell into retirement and have enjoyed every year of it. Good. So. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. Okay, well, thank you very much well, for participating. Th and, uh, thank you, Hannah, by golly, it's been a pleasure. Okay, I'm going to turn this off now. All right.